as we recognize and celebrate International SEL Day this week. Both Harmony and Inspire host these webinars where thought leaders and educators share best practices, teaching, and tools to support social and emotional learning. These presentations are the opinions and content of our guest speakers and may not necessarily be a direct representation of Harmony or Inspire. For best viewing of this webinar, it is recommended that you shut down your other browsers. If you have questions for any of our speakers, please use the question box on your GoToWebinar control panel. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and you will receive a copy of the recording within the next week. If you are watching this webinar live, you will receive a copy of the certificate of completion from GoToWebinar within 48 hours. You can also download a copy of the slide deck today under the handout tab on your GoToWebinar panel. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator. Dr. Jennings is an internationally recognized leader in the fields of social and emotional learning and mindfulness in education and professor of education at the School of Education and Human Development at the University of Virginia. Her research places specific emphasis on teacher stress and how it, apply, how it impacts the social and emotional context of the classroom. Her latest book, Teacher Burnout Turnaround, Strategies for Empowered Teachers, was released in December 2020. Welcome, Dr. Jenkins Jennings. Hi, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, and I'd just like to quickly go over our objectives for today. Uh, we will be re uh, reflecting on the importance of true self-care for educators, and we'll learn more about what that means. Uh, we'll hear inspirational stories from educators with strong SEL focus and learn about additional SEL opportunities uh, so that you can set your own SEL educator path forward. So next one. So uh, self-care can be challenging for educators. I know this as uh, someone who was an educator myself for 22 years, uh, but I love this quote. I think it, it inspires me to keep working on this, um, to orient myself towards self-care. Self-care is never a selfish act. It is simply good stewardship of the only gift I have, the gift I was put on earth to offer others. Anytime we can listen to truth, to true self and give the care it requires. We do it not only for ourselves, but for the many others whose lives we touch. This is from Parker Palmer uh, and his book, Let Your Life Speak. Uh, and today, self-care can be even harder than it usually is because of the COVID um, situation. It's just made things really difficult. First of all, let's look at what is self-care actually? We can think about it in several domains. There's the physical, the uh, this is you know getting the right food, exercise, taking care of our bodies. There's the social emotional, uh, sharing positive emotions with others, engaging in fun activities, um, listening to or watching comedy, building friendships. And I think it's also important to give ourselves time to process difficult emotions. That is another way we can care for ourselves rather than trying to avoid feelings or, or pushing aside feelings. Uh, in the intellectual space, learning new things, a hobby, a language, um, anything that's intellectually challenging. And then the spiritual uh, is connecting with either religious or secular community and spending time in nature, uh, anything that gives us a sense of connection with something greater than ourselves. Next. However, self-care, even though it seems like it might be simple, is not. Um, we know that there are many barriers to engaging in self-care, uh, and it's not just a spa day. <laughs> it's a lot more than that. It's the awareness and acceptance of our needs. It's being able to recognize when we have a need and prioritize it um, and recognize that we deserve to be well cared for. It's important to note that um, people who've been exposed to trauma as children or adults can sometimes have trouble uh, with self-care because as children, they may not have been cared well themselves. And so caring self-care may be particularly challenging. Mindfulness can help because it can give us the awareness of what 
we need. We can no begin to notice how we're feeling um, by bringing mindful awareness to our bodies and our thoughts and our feelings, which we can talk about more later. Um, next. So it's poll time. Yes, thank you, Dr. Jennings, for those inspiring words and that good information. Now it's poll time. We would like to hear from you, the audience. How often do you currently practice self-care? Go ahead and mark your answers on the screen that honestly reflect your current level of self-care. If you're not able to respond on the screen, you can type your answers in the question box. We'll give you a few minutes to select your answers. Hopefully everyone's having a chance to answer. Okay, the poll should be closing out soon and then we'll share results. Okay, so what we're seeing, 30, 32% every now and then, 27% once or twice a week, 18% once a day, and 23% as much as possible. Very good, keep up the good work, ladies and gentlemen. And now it's my pleasure to invite two award-winning educators to join our panel discussion about Educator SEL. Mr. Tom Wisenan is a fourth grade teacher from Reagan Elementary in Omaha, Nebraska, and he brought Harmony SEL to his classroom, his school, and his district. Mr. Wiz is always thinking about the connections with his students, and this past year, inspired to support other educators, he started his own podcast featuring weekly stories from educators and school leaders. Mr. Wiz is honored as the National University Harmony Teacher of the Year in 2019. Our second award-winning teacher is Mr. Alejandro Diaz Granados. Mr. Diaz teaches fourth and fifth grade students at Allison Elementary School in Washington, DC. Throughout the pandemic, while teaching virtually, Mr. Diaz has kept it his mission to stay connected to his students as his students are his daily inspiration. Mr. Diaz has received many honors, including National University Teacher of the Year for DC in 2020. Dr. Jennings, we invite you to ask these two amazing educators a few questions. Thank you. Yes, it's really great to be here with you both. Um, so first of all, let's start with Alejandro. Uh, what are some ways that you practice self-care? Yeah, sure. Thank you for asking. What a great question. Uh, especially during such a challenging year. Uh, so this pandemic has absolutely forced me to ensure that I'm properly caring for myself uh, before I care for others, especially. And for teachers, that's definitely a challenging thing to do, but I can tell you that it is so necessary. So uh, some things that I now make a part of my regular habits are you know, things like walking outside and walking my dog and uh, taking a breath of fresh air. And you know, all of these things are, are Definitely easy to do when things are going well. Um, however, when things are challenging, uh, that's when we forget to, you know, take that dog for a walk or take a deep breath outside. So for me, one strategy that's been extremely helpful is to keep a journal. Uh, this journal, I, you know, write down everything that brings me joy in this journal, things that I'm grateful for. Um, I also list, you know, even small things that uh, I enjoy doing, whether that is just going for a quick drive. Uh, and then I, in this journal, I'm also listing different things that, you know, may trigger uh, stressful situations. So this journal has kept me grounded throughout this entire year. And that's definitely something that I encourage other educators or anyone else to actually do as well. 
Thank you, Alejandro. And um, Tom, um, how do you keep uh, your plan and goals for self-care? You know, that's a fantastic question. First of all, thanks for having me. This is really an incredible, incredible time as we kind of end, uh, hopefully, the pandemic and move towards a sense of normalcy. But uh, during the pandemic, um, I think finding that sense of, of normalcy was really, really key. And I think that um, some of the ways that I encourage other people to, to find that, that normalcy and have that sense of self-care is that we have to really um, find those connections with other people. And it's kind of like a, I don't know, a, a duality here, right? Like we're forced to stay in, we're forced to be locked in. But at the same time, we have to really get past that and find that humanity with one another. And so one way I've done that is um, by reaching out with this podcast. It's called What the World Needs Now. It has over 1,500 downloads on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and Pandora. And I just really encourage um, people to get out of their comfort zone a little bit and find different ways to connect with one another. We really need to do that. Um, and maybe we don't get back to, to normal. Maybe it's a new normal and we really value those connections even more so than, than what we did um, as professionals, as educators, as, as human beings when we get out of this. Um, and I think another thing that this pandemic's made us do uh, is that it's really made us look for what makes us happy. What is it that makes us happy? Maybe I enjoy cooking and I've never taken the time to explore that side of myself before. Well, here I am locked in my house uh, with you know, uh, Amazon bringing me all the ingredients or Hello Fresh or whatever it is that you have. And uh, man, I really enjoy the smells and the odors and the sense of, of you know, being that, that cooking brings me. Um, so I think that those are some ways that we can encourage uh, other people and ourselves to really find this sense of normalcy and, and promote that self-care. Yeah, thank you, Tom. You know, what you reminded me of is that, you know, when we when we cook or we enjoy a meal, we're we're um, we can savor the, the the senses, the experience of that food. And in that way, we are also nourishing ourselves, you know, just by savoring the experience besides feeding ourselves. So thank you for sharing that. What about helping others in, with their self-care? Either one of you, how are you helping other educators with that? I'd really encourage um, uh, reaching out. I, I mentioned the podcast, but another thing that I've really, um, really would encourage people to do is to use the technology. I think this, this pandemic has driven educators in a way that uh, hasn't happened in maybe forever since that technology has been around. I, you know, when I got into education, you would slide in the floppy disk and play the Oregon Trail or play number munchers. And here we are zooming uh, to people from India or uh, from Africa or, or wherever. Um, and, uh, you know, getting into technology using TikTok or Twitter or uh, Facebook and really finding those connections is uh, something that I've really enjoyed. And um, I've, I've encouraged people to do that same thing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Alejandro, do you have anything to add? Yeah, uh, you know, and I would definitely agree with Tom there, just making that connection with people, you know, in a school building, uh, you know, when we're in the building, you know, teaching already feels like we're teaching on an island, but, you know, now that everyone is virtually teaching from their own home, um, you know, we even lose those small interactions like waving at the teacher next door through the window in their door or, uh, you know, just talking during in the teacher's lounge, you know, very simple interactions that we lose that are so beneficial to keeping us going each day, especially as teachers. Uh, so, you know, making connections with people and just looking for new opportunities and new ways to connect with others. Well, Alejandro and Tom, thank you so much for sharing your insights on your experiences with self-care. Really appreciate it. And uh, now I'd like to talk a little bit more about my research and just give you a little background. Um, I started my career as a teacher and then I became a teacher educator and I spent about 15 years supervising student teachers and observing them and also teaching classroom management. 
And I started to notice that emotion reactivity or challenges with emotional experiences in the classroom was interfering with classroom management. Uh, and what it made me realize is that there are certain skills, social emotional skills that teachers absolutely have to have that are not necessarily provided for them in their training. And so I started on this quest of figuring out what is this social emotional, what is teacher SEL basically? What are those skills we need? And so I did a large review of the literature and it was published in this paper in 2008 um, that has been building this new field of um, social emotional competencies in education. Uh, and what we looked at, uh, my colleague Mark Greenberg and I, if, you, if you're familiar with Mark Greenberg, he's the one that founded the PAVS curriculum. Um, he's an amazing leader in the field of SEL. So he and I looked at this literature and we all are aiming for that green box there in that picture. Students, social, emotional, and academic outcomes. We know that the classroom, the healthy classroom climate plays a big role in this. And we also know that uh, the ways in which teachers interact with their students, the relationships they build, the, um, the ways they manage their classroom, and also the ways they deliver social emotional learning in the classroom impact that. But what we didn't know was what is in this red box? You could call it a black box. <laughs> what are these skills that teachers need? And, and SEL is particularly important because even though you're teaching a lesson on SEL, if your behavior doesn't align with what you're teaching, if you're not walking the talk, then you're actually interfering with your teaching. Uh, it's one of those subject areas where you have to be the lesson that you are trying to deliver. Um, and that's not always easy. So I think that's why in the case of social emotional learning, educators own understanding of themselves and their own self uh, self-management is really, really important. Next slide. So in my research, as we started looking at the stress that teachers experience, because a lot of the, the problems with teacher SEL have to do with stress, that we see these negative spirals where a teacher, the demands of the classroom, the, the teacher is not prepared to handle these demands. They become emotionally, we become emotionally exhausted. Um, we don't, maybe our self-care isn't plugged in well, and we just get drained, completely drained. Um, then when we're, when we are exhausted, we lose our capacity to be resilient, and we can sometimes become reactive. And that's what I was observing in my classroom observations, was watching this reactivity, which can actually exacerbate student behavior um, and can create this negative cycle where the disruption contributes to the demands and keeps things going. Next slide. So right now, living with COVID, um, we are all living through this stressor. This is, uh, you know, stress and trauma are challenging for all of us, but right now, everybody's experiencing this. Um, and we're also being faced, having to face the incredible disparities that we have in our society and how some students are able to access learning and other students are not. Um, we're also seeing that uh, levels of depression and anxiety and loneliness and hopefulness are all on the rise. Next slide. So, um, what is something that's helped you stay strong for your students in the last year? I think that is for I can start. Yeah, I can yeah, definitely go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. So, you know, um, something that has helped me stay strong for my students has honestly been uh, my students themselves and, you know, the resilience that they've had. I can't imagine what it must have been like to, you know, leave school in March uh, with all of their supplies and not return and not know when they're going to see their friends or play on the playground or high five their friends. Um, you know, everything that they know that was normal for them has been completely uprooted. Um, however, my students, you know, are logging in uh, while taking care of siblings, while uh, you know, nursing younger children while, you know, on the Metro bus, just to hear my voice, just to hear instruction, just to hear education. Um, and that makes things like spilling my coffee seem very minuscule. 
So they are, you know, the, the pushing and the driving force that keeps me going every single day, uh, especially during this tough year. You know, uh, one thing that I can, um, one thing that I know is when I log in each morning, I'll be able to see 15 to 20 smiles, uh, you know, excited, ready to go and ready to learn. So they keep me going for sure. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, and Tom, what about you? What what if what have you noticed? Um, you know, I've noticed that um, the same thing Alejandro said. Uh, the relationships matter, and we knew that kind of going into this pandemic that you needed to try to connect, uh, stay connected to your class, stay connected to the individuals, stay connected to um, the parents, and in the structure that was there. Uh, but I think this pandemic has really forced us to hone in on that fact and really put um, priority on the relationships, right? And I think when kids saw uh, teachers who would make that a priority, they they really responded in a positive way. And I think that really makes a huge difference. That really gives me a lot of hope, Tom. Thank you for both of you. Thank you for sharing this. Um, how about, uh, can you speak to how um, Harmony or Inspire uh, may have helped during this time for you? One thing that I noticed was when we made this transition, uh, kind of a hasty transition from in-person instruction, I think it was last March, at least in my school district, to um, going full virtual, shutting the schools down and going remote 100%. Um, man, was it tough? Was it tough? We had to not only transition um trying to manage classroom manage learning but then also come up with materials that would sustain a lesson or sustain um our own staff development and so something that i really appreciated was um harmony's ability to see that respond to that change and make their lessons uh remote friendly um their curriculums available 100 percent online i quickly went online took screenshots of some of the conversation cards some of the activity cards that i knew students would be able to um play or, or, or complete or do with their their siblings or parents just so that that social emotional piece of learning was still there and could be part of their routine and another thing i really appreciated from um uh, national university was the inspire modules i told my staff that one thing that really made a big difference in in some normalcy is logging in and doing these modules 30 minutes 60 minutes just to stay sharp on, in our own way mentally on topics that were relevant to us and so those two uh, programs were absolutely fantastic when it came time to uh move uh virtual thank you tom so let's go back to some more um, research here. So um, after really exploring this need that, that I saw um, we all have as educators, I started to think about how to create a program that would support uh, educators um, through and, and provide those skills that I saw were lacking. And uh, when we were thinking about how to develop this program, we, um, we were, uh, trying to envision what is it that we want to see in a teacher um, and what qualities would we want to cultivate and what practices would we think would align with those. And um, we came up with a kind, clear, calm model. It's a model that, that, that we're, we're promoting calmness, clarity, and kindness, that those were the three things we thought we needed to work on. So we saw compassion practices, mindful awareness practices, and emotion skills as ways to cultivate those. Um, and next slide. Uh, so this is how we, uh, the next slide, we came up with this kind, clear, calm model that um, my colleagues have have other people have been also developing programs based on this model of this is where where we're headed the other thing i forgot to mention at the beginning at their earlier slide is that we ground all this in teachers own secular ethics their own motivation for why they're a teacher the values that you bring to your teaching work um, because that helps motivate you to continue doing this great work so next slide so the program that that we developed is called Cultivating Awareness and Resilience in Education or CARE. And because we were trying to see, not only were we able to support teachers' well being and help manage stress, but also improve the interactions with their students, 
their classroom management, their, the quality of their classroom interactions, and student outcomes. We, we figured we needed to create a pretty heavy duty intervention. So the care program that I'm gonna talk about, the version was very intensive at the beginning as we were conducting this research. It involved five days of training uh, with intermittent uh, spread out over the fall and, um, and then coaching in between. Next slide. And so the, the program is based on these elements. Self-care is the primary reason that we're encouraging people to come to the program. Um, the emotional awareness part uh, it involves didactic lessons on the nature of emotion, why you can get stressed out while you're teaching, like why that happens. It's pretty, you, when you start learning about the emotional system and the stress response, it makes sense why as educators, we get stressed out in the classroom. It's kind of a setup in a way for stress. Um, and so when we learn that, it normalizes that experience. And then it gives us the, then we learn tools to deal with the stress that we're feeling um, using mindful awareness practices and empathy and compassion practices. And then in the training, we apply this understanding and this learning to role play situations. So we get a chance to play out scenarios that may have been challenging and find different ways to approach those challenging scenarios in a, in a role play experience. Next slide. So in our research, as I said, we were aiming for, to look at these outcomes. And what we found was that the teachers who, we, we did this in a very large randomized trial in New York City with 224 teachers in 36 elementary schools. And uh, we randomly assigned the, the teachers to either get the care program or be in a waitlist control condition. And then we looked at the difference between those two groups afterwards. And what we found was that the teachers psychological distress was reduced, their time urgency. This is a really common stressor for us educators. The feeling, you guys ever feel this way, Alejandro and Tom, like you don't have enough time to finish something? It's kind of an all the time feeling, right? So learning how to cope with that feeling and, and, and building the, the tolerance to that feeling because it's a never, never ending feeling. Um, that went down, um, mindfulness went up and emotion regulation improved. But we also showed improvements in the classroom quality of interactions. We had observers going into the classrooms and watched, student, watched what was going on and coded the, the classroom interactions, and they were more emotionally supportive significantly in the classrooms of the teachers that had the care program. Um, the teachers were more sensitive to the needs of the children, and the classroom was more emotionally positive climate-wise. Finally, we did show improvements in student outcomes, which really was exciting. Um, we expected, we chose a sample that we were working in with very high need students because we figured the average kid who's doing okay, whether their teacher is more mindful or not may not make a big difference, but a kid who really needs social support from their teacher, that might really make a difference. And that's exactly what we found. Among all of our students, we showed that they were more engaged. Um, however, the kids who were low on social skills, not only did they improve engagement, they also improved in reading competence. So it, it was actually a nice proof point that when those kids who are in, the ones that really need the social support, they can even show improvements in academics. Next slide. Time for another poll. We're really enjoying the information that we're gathering from the panel, but Audience, now it's time for another poll, the chance for us to hear from you. So how do you practice mindfulness? How often are you practicing those mindfulness strategies? Please answer on the screen. And again, if you can't answer on the screen, feel free to put your answer in the question box and we'll share out once everyone has a chance to answer. I'm seeing a few every now and thens and a few not enoughs. A lot of practice every day and once a week as well.
a little bit more time for everyone to answer. And I'm going to venture a guess that now that we're learning these wonderful strategies, there'll be a lot more mindfulness practiced. So here we are. Practice every day, 39%, very good. About once a week, 18%. Every now and then, 22%, and not often enough, 21%. Thank you for participating. And now back to you, Dr. Jennings. Thank you, wow, I was actually really impressed. 39% does it every single day, that's amazing. Uh, I highly encourage you to keep, keep it up. It, it really can make a big difference. Um, yeah, so um, going back to this research again, um, one of the other exciting things about our research was we followed the teachers over the course of a whole year. And these um, impacts on mindfulness, psychological distress, and emotion regulation continued. The trajectory kept improving. So it wasn't something that was just a one-shot thing. It really got teachers moving in the right direction. Um, and the other thing is that the teachers that were higher, had higher levels of psychological distress at the beginning showed improvements in um, emotion regulation compared to the other groups. So we saw that this really made a, a great difference for, for teachers. And even though CARE, you know, a CARE is a, a very intensive program and, and you can learn more about it from at Create for Education uh, if you wanna learn more, um, but you can also, uh, you can learn for yourself some of these skills as well. Um, so next uh, slide. So what's exciting about this research is a mindfulness-based intervention, an MBI, that was able to impact an individual was also able to impact the context. And I think this is really key because often as educators, we don't realize what a huge impact we do have on our context. Um, and we do. Uh, it's easy to sometimes forget that. Um, next slide. Uh, and in that sense, the context has the impact on the individual. So this is how we can see that our self-care has these trickle-down effects onto, into our students and our students' learning. Next slide. So if you wanna learn more about some of these ideas, um, I highly encourage you to look at some of these resources. Uh, Mindfulness for Teachers is a book that covers a lot of the content that's in the CARE program. So if you'd like further uh, information about what we do in that training, you can read that book. Um, the Trauma-Informed Classroom, or uh, yeah, that book, it also applies some mindfulness-based approaches to supporting children uh, and youth exposed to trauma. And then there's uh, a couple other books here that are helpful for learning strategies for developing mindfulness in the classroom. Finally, I have a new book, this Teacher Burnout Turnaround book, that is intended to support teachers' ability to really think through how we can recover from this. Uh, I, I started writing before COVID, but I see COVID has actually opened the doors, as both Tom and Alejandro were talking about, to remake things differently, to do things differently. And this book uh, provides opportunities to think about how we might do that, to help relieve our burnout too. Uh, so um, thank you so much for uh, 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 having me here. I really appreciate it. So, um, how have you continued uh, our educators' reflection? Sorry, how have you continued your uh, focus on student relationships this past year in different learning env environments? Alejandra, you want to start with you? Sure. So for me, uh, I have looped with my students from third grade, and I now teach them in fourth grade and fifth grade. So for me, I um have just really dove into those relationships that i started last year and uh reconnecting with families um you know brothers and sisters and siblings who are all involved in uh ensuring that you know our students get the educational uh, experience that they deserve so uh you know it, it has been critical to focus on student relationships this year uh especially when uh, so many of my students have to work independently uh, whether they're working, you know, uh, at their parents' job and using the Wi-Fi there, they're working at home. 
um, you know, having that relationship and personal relationship with each student has been so helpful for me uh, in ensuring that they still get their educational experience. That's really, uh, really important. And I just thought as I was looking at the next question, it's really relates to you too, Alejandro. Um, have you supported your students in these times with social unrest and especially in Washington DC where you're located? Yeah, yeah, no, it, it's it's absolutely challenging and uh, teachers are on the front lines, you know, again, um, not only addressing learning gaps, but the devastation of COVID-19 and, you know, social unrest going on throughout the entire nation. So for me, um, you know, I know that it's challenging for students to try to grapple this while at home and, uh, you know, they may not have the opportunity to ask questions to an adult that they have around. Um, so I've made it a priority to ensure that I provide my students with several opportunities to share and speak. Uh, and uh, speak to each other as if we were in the classroom sitting on the carpet. So, um, you know, I'll make uh, virtual community circles uh, just to allow them to have the opportunity to speak and ask questions. You know, they uh, most definitely need to hear from us and be supported by their teachers um, and also learning from their classmates and, you know, getting that critical social and emotional support that they probably wouldn't get, um, you know, elsewhere. So school is such a a critical place for them to receive that. So even though if they're learning virtual or hybrid, we want to make sure that they're still having the opportunity to share uh, uh, how they feel and we want to make sure that we're still supporting them. Thank you, Alejandra. Um, Tom, would you like to add anything? Yeah, uh, I just would love to second everything Alejandro said. Those relationships, those connections um, are just are just paramount. You know, I was thinking about what you said, Dr. Jennings, about how um, if a teacher is mindful of their situation, that then goes to the context, and then that context then goes to the individual. And as we started this journey through COVID in um, March of last year, uh, wow, what a what a stressful time. But um, I think Alejandro uh, really hits the point where we need to keep the focus on those individuals. In my classroom, it looked like me carving out a half hour for each child individually each week so I could meet with the parents, I could meet with the child, I could address uh, homework issues or issues with the parent's job or I can't make this class meeting because mom has to work or dad has to work or we don't have uh, child care or uh, whatever the issue is in a private setting to uh, support those individuals. Um, but uh, as we return to school here, I still carve out that time for my remote learners. You know, I take them to the hallway and and say, hey, what's going on? How are you doing? At least once a week, if not, you know, every time they're online, just get five minutes individually because it's easy to do when we're in a classroom. Just carve out that time to walk by and say, hey, how are you doing? Um, hope you're having a great Wednesday or Thursday or whatever it is. But I think taking that time and being mindful of that, as you were saying, Dr. Jennings, that mindful mindfulness piece is, is ultra important. So I think keeping that uh, at the front of educators' mind as we move out of COVID and, and back into schools is just absolutely incredibly important. What you made me realize, as you said that, Tom, is that, first of all, the context is completely different when you're working remotely, right? But, but also you're in a way doing a home visit in a way, right? Because you're seeing into your students' homes and you're connecting more, maybe more often than you were before. I don't know. What, what have you noticed about that? So I've noticed a couple different things. One thing um, is that we have to be mindful, again, mindfulness playing into this, uh, of the student situation. Maybe they don't want to have their camera on and we need to be aware of that uh, for whatever reason. Maybe they're uh, going through a messy situation at home. Maybe they're not comfortable sharing their surroundings and we as educators need to um, take that into account when we're interacting with families and students. Um, but I have really enjoyed getting to know the parents more. I have interacted with parents more probably this last year than I had uh, previously. Uh, and it's been a wonderful interaction. I've, I, as a teacher, felt very, very supported. I hope that I've brought the parents into a supportive environment as well. So that's something that, that's been a benefit, definitely. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Alejandro, have you noticed that too? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, and as Tom said, I've had, uh, you know, so much more contact with parents. I actually uh, completed all of my parent teacher conferences just because they were, you know, so or they're able, you know, we're able to connect with them now and they don't have to, you know, come in after work and sit with us and talk with us. So, you know, I, um, you know, we're, we're learning so much about each other. So, you know, it just makes the relationship so much better. My students even know when it's time for me to walk my dog. You know, they know everything about me and I know everything about them and what's going on. So uh, when there is situations where they can't turn on their camera or uh, they respond better in the chat, you know, it's easier for me to understand. Yeah, thanks. Well, thank you both for shedding light on the importance of focusing on our students during this really challenging time. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Jennings, so much for sharing your latest research on the importance of educator SEL. Tom and Alejandro, thank you so much for inspiring us today with your stories and with your passion for both educators and students. We really appreciate that. Now we're thrilled to have another special guest join us to provide another key perspective to today's dialogue. Dr. Lori Polowski, as a professor and acting associate dean and chair of the teacher education department here at National University. She is dedicated to advancing diversity, inclusivity, access, equity, and social and emotional learning in teacher education programs and in clinical practice. Thank you for joining our conversation today, Dr. Polowski. Good afternoon, it's wonderful to be here. And it's Gosh, just to listen to Dr. Jennings talk about her research and then to actually hear from practitioners that are boots on the ground and we're so proud of them. Um, just being able to reinforce the research that has already been discussed is just invigorating. But we have sat for about 40 minutes, so I would like us all to take a mindfulness moment and just take, close your eyes, take one big deep breath and count to three, let it out, relax your shoulders, Take one more deep breath. Exhale. And open your eyes. I think we all just need that moment every once in a while. And it's really hard for me sometimes to remind myself to do that during the day, as well as reminding my faculty. So thank you for just taking that second with us as we embark on this last just little bit part of um, the webinar. And so as as he had said, I am Lori Plowski. I am chair of the teacher education department. So really intimately working with teacher candidates. And I think Tish has a question for me. Yeah, can you um, please share from your perspective, knowing the challenges that educators are facing today, um, what can colleges of education do to best support new teachers in this current challenging environment? I think we need to remember and remind ourselves that emotions matter. They matter in the classroom, they matter in our interactions with each other and how we model that. But I think um, the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence survey really shedded some great light on the 5,000 participants that they had in their survey, asking teachers to unpack what emotions they're feeling currently. And the top emotions that came to light were anxious, fearful, worried, overwhelmed, and sad. So when we talk about that emotions matter, I think that we need to keep in mind what those emotions are and everything that you shared with us up until this point, we need, we need to be mindful of, right, in all of our interactions. And so I think as uh, teacher prep programs, we need to just maybe shift and pivot a little bit. And I think we all have, I think across the whole country, um, people have done a marvelous job in their programs, but um, we need to make sure that the feelings are valued and they're felt because we can talk it, but just as you had said earlier, and I had this written down, that we need to walk the talk. And if we're not walking the talk and we're not modeling it, um, then I think it's worthless words that we're just spouting out. And so I think really modeling what it looks like um, through equity and social and emotional learning, we need, to, we, may, we need to be able to let them feel it and be able to model it for them so that they can then go out to their so our teachers and our interns can go out and they can model it for their for their students. But as faculty, we need to do that work um, and we need to really be mindful of how we do that. We also need to really acknowledge the pandemic and the social unrest that's happening, um, whether that's uncomfortable or not. I think we need to have those conversations with our faculty and I think people have. We need to have those with our adjuncts 
and really empower them to be comfortable in uncomfortable spaces to have those conversations. Um, and then to re really realize that there's not only trauma that's firsthand going on, but our adjuncts and our, and our student teachers and our interns, they're feeling secondhand trauma. And so really to recognize that, that you know, they're in their own space dealing with their own you know, invisible backpack, that we need to remember that they are serving PK-12 students as well, but they're experiencing the same emotions. It's, it, it can be a lot. And so how do we as a teacher ed program support all these different layers you know, that actually trickle down to those students in seats? And so this is why I loved listening to our practitioners today. Um, Tom and Alejandro are amazing models of, of how this works. Last thing I think we need to build in that self-care that everybody's talked about today. Um, the practices, the modeling, the giving permission. I think we need to all give each other permission and grace and empathy to take moments to do this. Where typically in the past before COVID, we did not, we did not create that space and curriculum time. You know, we got to get through page 29, 30. You know, you know, this is this is just as important. So I think those would be my top um, five examples. Thank you so much. I couldn't agree more. And um, you made me think of time urgency when you said that, which is one of those outcomes that we were looking at. Um, and yeah, I, it, there, there's uh, so much. I think in in many ways, um, one ways one way we can help our educators is is give them space or permission to be human. I think that's one of the the problems in education. We've kind of gotten this idea that we're supposed to be, you know, not real. And some of the best ways that we can model our own emotional regulation is to be honest about what's happening with us. And one really simple thing I always um, describe that you can do is when you are feeling frustrated, say, I'm feeling frustrated and explain what it feels like. Oh, you know, I feel my shoulders are tight. My jaw is tight. I feel hot. You know, I feel you know nervous or whatever it is. And then say, you know, but I know how to deal with this. I know what to do. I'm going to take those breaths like you you just had us do to calm down. And wow, look, I feel so much better. Now we can go on, you know? <laughs> exactly. And I, I don't think as educators, like you said, we, we haven't given each other permission to do that in class because we have so much pressure, pressure on ourselves to really deliver content. Um, but that positive learning environment and those relationships that we've been talking about today are, are just as important. Yeah, and today, could you share some examples about how colleges of education are supporting Educator SEL right now? Sure, it's been exciting work um, here at National, but I know across the country, my colleagues have been having similar conversations. But one, the immediate adjustments that had to happen immediately um, when COVID first came about a year ago, you know, the pivot that had to be made really quickly. So adjustments for supporting our candidates that are in schools, you know, all of a sudden they were face to face and then they were going virtual. The school districts, every school district was doing something different. And so here they are, have classmates and every single classmates in a different situation. And so helping them understand that that's OK. <laughs> right. And then helping support both the university support providers and the mentor teachers that are in the school. What does that look like? And so I think we've really built that culture of care. And so I liked when you talked about care in, in your research, because I think that culture is so important to build through all of the different layers um, of support through teacher prep programs. Um, supporting faculty. So I think if we're not supporting our faculty, the students aren't going to feel it, our interns and student teachers, and then the PK-12 students aren't going to feel it. So really honoring them and where they're, where they're at and supporting them on how we can um, help them to be able to feel comfortable with this different type of support that we're providing. Um, and then really thinking about empathy and grace. I think every conversation I have with students right now that are struggling, um, we end up talking about empathy and grace. And so, you know, you gotta give other people grace and you gotta give yourself grace. You gotta, you know, some, some of us are so hard on ourselves. And so I, I think that conversation has really been unique um, and I think teacher prep programs are embracing those types of conversations differently. And then embedding SEL into our curriculum. So we were a little bit ahead of the game um, prior to COVID. We had already started really not just SEL as a course or SEL as a component of a course, um, but really embedding it in all of our assignments. And it's who we say we are, right? 
and, and we're modeling it and we're walking the walk and talking the talk. But it really starts from an inside out approach and that's my third point. Um, it really has to begin with the instructors that are delivering the content. So it's really taking the time to work with our instructors, both faculty and adjuncts to be able to understand SEL. And so these kind of um, webinars are absolutely beautiful. Harmony has been great. Um, and so moving forward, I think we're gonna see more and more teacher prep programs really delving in and it not being a, a, something that's just standalone, but just like the schools are doing, we're embedding it throughout our program and it's just who we say we are. And that just really goes into what kind of curriculum and mindsets that we have as we're developing this for our candidates um, and how, again, how we are providing the space for having these conversations that sometimes are uncomfortable, but we need to peel back those layers and um, get to that space where this is just what we do. And so I think, I think that is how SEL in teacher ed is now going to be pushed forward at a high rate of speed. I mean, Harmony is in thousands of schools across the whole entire country. I know that they're looking for different types of positions in school districts right now. So it, it is an exciting time and it's been a catalyst, I think, for everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, it, I, I couldn't agree more with you about this. And I, I think this gives us an opportunity to really think through how to better prepare um, our students in a way that prevents this burnout that we're seeing as a big problem. You know, we're losing teachers um, in the profession. So the more we can um, proactively prepare them um, in a way that builds their own resilience so they're ready um, when they come in, uh, I think it, make a, it can make a big difference overall. Well, and it's been really exciting because we've had principals and um, mentor teachers actually say how excited they were that, you know, they were in schools that didn't have an SEL curriculum or has, have, it has not been an initi initiative within their schools and our candidates are bringing that to them. And so it's, it's been really exciting to hear the positive feedback and the excitement our candidates get that they're contributing so much, so. Can you tell us more about the courses? Yes, I would love to. So um, like I said, we've been really proactive with being a leader in SEL here at National University. And in one of those ways is um, by developing SEL professional development courses for teachers. These are 100% free. They're free access, they're on-demand courses with resources. Literally, you can get in, you can access these resources and you can start an hour later. It's giving you practical hands-on knowledge and application. Um, 45 free modules designed to help you explore and build healthy relationships and positive learning environments. We have heard nothing but positive um, things about this because it is practitioner um, focused. So, and then awesome. we have, yeah, it's so exciting. Um, and then we have some, we, from there we had such a huge, um, you know, buzz go around it and so many people that we actually had some graduate credits now that you can take. And I think that was the second one on the last slide. Um, that you can take after and earn two courses to bring into one of our Masters of Arts in Education. So those other modules um, are also available. Then we have um, our degree programs, which we're so excited and proud of and so much work in um, really taking the time to do it right has happened um, because I think you can just throw stuff together without really taking the time to look and talk to professionals across the country and experts. and. Mark Greenberg helped us out a little bit with this. And so, as you know, he's like one of our leaders. So we have the Masters of Arts in Social Emotional Learning. It's the first Master of Arts um, in Social Emotional Learning that's discipline-based. So you can go other places, you can, you can get concentrations or emphasis areas, but this is one that is 100% discipline-based masters. Um, so it's very, very exciting. And it's very well done. It's done from an inside out equity lens. And so we, we go there with each of you to really develop who you are on the inside as an educator or in your educational community um, to be able to become leaders in SEL. Then we have our MED with an emphasis in SEL and that's our credential program where they can earn their credential and then they can earn their masters with an emphasis in SEL. And we have had an increase of about 30% who have switched over since we've offered this and they are really leaning in and discovering what that means. And so that's exciting in itself, just to see the large numbers moving over into that emphasis area. And then last but not least, we have our Master's of Arts of Education, which is not a credential program. Um, it's a customized master's that you can choose to have an emphasis in SEL, but you can bring in your prior learning 
um, and you can bring in your prior lived experiences with um, providing evidence to put towards that. And there's also a scholarship for $7,500. So it's a, it's a great deal, um, but three great opportunities, all very different, and we're just excited to be able to share them with you. Thank you. And Dr. Michael Cunningham, our NU Chancellor, just wanted to make sure that he was able to resonate with you today. And so he provided a wonderful statement to our commitment to educators. And he said, the national university system is dedicated to working with others to identify more opportunities that make quality education accessible to life lifelong learners. And that dedication has been really shown throughout the whole university, has become a really focus um, and a real commitment um, across the board. So, okay. thank you ladies. We really appreciate you guys being here today, you being with us today. Our amazing guests have shared some incredible examples of how you can embark on your own SEL journey, whether it's exploring new educational opportunities as we saw, or increasing your self-care time. What we would love for you to do is think about your commitment, write it down so you keep track of it. What commitment are you willing to make to yourself around self-care. And we also would love to invite you to join us in other events this week as we celebrate International SEL Day, co-hosted by Harmony, Inspire, and National University. You can see all the scheduled events on the link here. We hope you will join our Twitter chat on Friday. It's our National University Twitter account, and you can follow us at hashtag NUSEL to join the chat. Thank you all for joining us today, for taking time out of your busy schedules to learn more about shining the bright light on adult SEL. We also look forward to you joining us at our next webinar on April 29th, when award-winning teachers, Dr. Melissa Collins and Mr. Michael Danella, will share how they help bridge the racial divide with innovative technology and Harmony SEL resources. You can register on our webinar page for this powerful webinar that you really won't wanna miss. Once this webinar comes to a close, a survey will launch on your screen. It is a very short survey and we would greatly appreciate your feedback. We do read your feedback and take your responses seriously. To this day, your responses have helped us build more successful webinars. Thank you for being here and everyone stay safe and enjoy the rest of your day.